ready to get started. We've got our goggles on, we've got our gloves on, we've got our hair tied back, we've got some kind of old dirty shirt that we can change out of later, we've got our tray, we've got our pig, we've removed all the pig juices, we've thrown away the bag that the pig came into, and we've got our tools and we are ready to get started. So, in our dissecting kit that you guys have purchased at the bookstore, we have several different tools. So you have a ruler, you have a probe, scissors, tweezers, and a scalpel. You also have tiny little pins, and these pins are really useful for pushing down other parts of the pig or moving stuff. Again, this will press nicely into the wax bottom that we have on the bottom of our tray to keep them nice and straight up. So let's talk about a little bit about our tools. So this is a probe. So this is basically a very fine-tipped picking tool. And so what we want to do is we want to pick through membranes. If I have a thick membrane like this, you almost want to scrape through this and it'll actually start breaking up those really thin membranes. And now this is a great tool because you actually don't have to cut anything, you don't have to press down. So this will actually help you clear away those areas to expose your organs that you're trying to get to and identify. Next up is our scissors and our tweezers. Now remember, one person should be pretty much doing the dissection at all times while the other person takes notes, takes pictures, etc. So what you always want to do is you want to lift up with the tweezers and you want to cut with the scissors. Now this is basically to remove layer by layer so you don't end up damaging anything. So we can lift and then cut right at this connective tissue and then we're going to lift again, cut right at that connective tissue and then we're going to slowly peel layer by layer away. And this will help us not damage any of the organs that are underneath or any of those thin vessels like arteries and veins that you can easily, easily cut through. So the last tool is our scalpel. And probably most of you guys are very familiar with the scalpel and you guys all want to play doctor. But this is actually not a very good tool to use, not in our case. So the scalpel can actually be very dull. And what you'll have to do is you'll actually have to press down quite hard to actually break into anything. Now you can't stop or control how deep you go in with the scalpel. And so this can actually damage those organs and those fine vessels that we were talking about. So unless you're breaking bones, you really want to avoid the scalpel. And again, your best friend will probably be the tweezers and the scissors. So we're going to lift and cut, lift and cut right at that connective tissue. And again, if you go nice and slow, you won't end up damaging any of those organs that we're looking for. Uh, next up is gloves. So we will actually be providing you guys gloves, but you never want to leave the classroom with the gloves on. So you could potentially contaminate things outside, and so you always want to take the gloves off and throw them away before you need to leave the classroom for any reason. Um, with that, please use the gloves sparingly. They do cost a lot of money if we keep buying them over and over again, so go easy on the gloves. Next up are our goggles. So you want to make sure that they're the type of goggles that fit securely on your face and then actually cover all your eyes. So you don't want any of those stick lenses ones that can actually get stuff in between. So you want to make sure that they will completely cover your face. So the next thing you're going to get, which the TA will provide you again, is this bag. And this bag is actually going to have a little tag in it and strings. You don't want to throw any of this away. So you want to keep the bag, you want to keep the tag, and you want to keep the strings for all four weeks of your pig dissection. So we're going to set this aside and the very next thing that you guys are going to do is you're going to go and get a tray. So this is again, same tray for each pair of partners and you're going to go get your tray and then in the corner in the fume hood you're going to go get your pig. And we've got our cute little fetal pig here and you can see it's kind of sitting in this liquidy mass. So the very first thing that we're going to do when you get your pig is you're going to cut a little hole in the bag and you're actually going to dump this liquid out and this liquid does not go down the sink. This liquid goes into our receptacles, which I will show you in just a second. So now that we've gotten our pig, we've grabbed a tray, and we've gotten our fetal pig. So you can see the fetal pig comes in this bag, and it's got a lot of extra fluid here. So what we want to do is instead of opening that and letting that pour all over our tray, we want to get rid of that right away. So you want to grab a pair of scissors and just cut a small little corner so that you've got an opening in your bag, like so. And then you want to hold the pig firmly and then pour the juices into the bucket labeled pig juices. So animal juice, excess animal juice in this bucket. This is the bucket that you want to pour your juices into. Now you're going to notice that in the fume hood where this bucket is, there's two other buckets. Those buckets are also labeled pig parts and pig parts on paper towels. So again, you want to make sure that you know which proper bucket you're putting this stuff into. So when you bring your pig back to your tray, what you want to do is then cut the bag completely open. So, you want to get rid of this bag because we're no longer going to be storing the pig in this bag. And again, any extra juices go in the back of the bucket. And then the plastic bag can just get thrown away in the regular trash. Okay. 
So now we've got our pig, we've placed him on our tray, and you don't want to tie him up just yet. And by tie him up, I'm referring to the strings that you find in our bag. So each pair of partners is going to get this little bag, which comes with a tag and comes with strings. Do not throw away the bag, the tag, or the strings the entire time, because this is the only bag and strings that you're going to get. So the prep lab will not give you any more strings, so please do not throw anything in this bag away. So what you're going to do is you're going to open your bag, you're going to set the tag aside, and you're going to grab the strings. You want to place the strings aside for just now because we're not going to tie him up yet. But what you do want to do is you want to start looking at his external anatomy. So we want to determine first off if it's a male pig or a female pig. And that's actually really easy to do. So most people look at, at the stomach here, which you can see on the bottom side of the pig, and you see all these tiny little bumps. These little bumps are papillae, and these specifically are mammary papillae, which means they're basically nipples. So that is the equivalent, is mammary paplia. And so paplia just means, like I said, little bump. And so automatically a lot of people are going to say, okay, well it has to be a female pig because she has mammary paplia. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point you can actually point around to any guy in the room and go, he also has mammary <laughs> paplia. So that is not a good indicator of if it's a male or a female mm -hmm. pig. So we also notice right here this little flap that's poking out of the stomach. This is his umbilical cord right here. And this is where the fetus attaches to the mother. So this is where the fetus gets all the uh, nutrients from. So what you want to do is if you kind of lift that up and look underneath, in a male pig, the uh, urogenital opening would be right about here, just underneath the umbilical cord. It would be a little tiny hole, and that is his urogenital opening. But in females, it is actually all the way here in the back. So what you notice if you lift the tail up and right underneath the anus, is this little bump. This is another papillae. Again, papillae just means little bump. So we've got this little papillae. This is her genital papillae because it is covering her urogenital opening. So you can actually see there's a tiny hole right there and that is her urogenital opening. So once again, in males, the male urogenital opening is going to be right under here underneath the umbilical cord and the female urogenital opening is going to be back here underneath the tail. Males do not have a genital paplia. So this little indicator, this little bump right here, is her genital paplia. And that's the first indicator and the easiest indicator of telling the difference between a male and a female pig. Okay, so now we're actually going to start cutting into our pig. So the first section on your sheet after external anatomy is cheek dissection. So what, I want you to follow the instructions in the book and I want you to read them, but we're going to modify them just a little bit. The book does have some good techniques, but I also have some good little shortcuts that will help as well. So, since our pig is already open, all of your pigs should have this incision towards the neck and the chest area. This is basically because they inject the arteries and the veins with dyes so you can help tell the difference. So the blue is always going to be veins and the pink is always going to be arteries. Since we've got this nice big incision already and we can kind of look inside the pig, that's exactly what we're going to do is we're going to start there and kind of cut some of this connective tissue again just underneath the skin, just at the connective tissue, and we're going to start peeling it away. So what I'm doing is I'm lifting and cutting very, very shallow. So I'm looking into the pig, I'm moving my tweezers so that I can maximize the lift and see very clearly what I'm cutting. You never want to just start cutting straight down because you never know what you're going to cut. And especially around this cheek area, there's a very thin nerve called the facial nerve and a lot of people end up cutting that off. The good thing about this pig is that they have two cheeks and so if you mess the first one up, you can always go and cut the other cheek up. That's fine. But if you go nice and slow, you shouldn't ever cut anything away that is needed. So again, we're lifting, cutting at that connective tissue, watching where we're going. Don't worry about these tiny little veins and stuff. So we're just peeling away that skin. Once you get a nice good flap of skin, you want to cut that off and get rid of that. We want to see what we're doing, so you always want to make it as clear as possible. So again, we're going to go up towards the eye, lifting, cutting at this connective tissue always moving around the tweezers where you need them. And again, always the same person lifting and cutting. You can't have your partner lifting and you cutting. This needs to be a coordinated effort. And so it really is best if only one person does it. But you should definitely take turns. You should take turns cutting through these guys and really experiencing 
the dissection because it'll help you remember. Because if you remember, oh man, I cut that gross cheek open, then it'll stick with you and it'll actually be easier to study for your final. So I'm going to lift this away, cut some of this away. Okay, so now when we've got this thick membrane stuff, which you can see right here, this scrape tool is actually really, really handy in picking away this membrane without damaging any of the organs. So you want to lift this neck muscle away. All this fatty neck tissue in here, this is your parotid. So this is all this fatty neck tissue that surrounds the whole neck right here. And that's for protection for the pig. So what we want to do is we want to remove that. And you can actually see the picture in your book of the tool being pulled away. So all of this parotid is being pulled back to expose the organs that are underneath. So we want to get through this parotid. So all this fatty glandy stuff, this is all parotid gland. So glands are either going to look like fatty tissue or they're going to look like little beans. So in this case, the parotid gland looks like fatty tissue. You can see this big round circular muscle right here. That is your masseter muscle or masseter muscle. So that controls the jaw, obviously. This is your big, big cheek muscle. Now, if you carefully pick away some of this membrane towards the top of the masseter muscle, you can see this very thin, almost whitish, little tube. This guy right here going all the way across the masseter muscle, this is your facial nerve right here. So a lot of people will cut this away if you go too deep. So you want to be very careful. So you want to remember that the one on the top of the masseter muscle, that's going to be your facial nerve. All right. So we've got, again, this is parotid gland. So this parotid gland actually leads into its own little tube underneath the cheek. So the line going on top of the masseter muscle is the facial nerve. This line going underneath right here, it feeds in. You can see this blue and white line coming here, and it leads into all this parotid stuff here. That is going to be your parotid duct. So just remember, even if you can't see it very well in your pig or perhaps you've cut it away, if we're talking about pinning the line up here, it's going to be your facial nerve. If we're putting the pin here, it's going to be your masseter muscle. All the way over here in this fatty neck tissue, that would be your parotid gland. And again, this little tubey guy right down here, that's going to be your parotid duct. Now, if we remove some more of this parotid gland, and again, this is all just fatty neck tissue, so I know that I'm not going to hurt anything. You guys want to be a little bit more careful than this. But once you remove all of this, kind of pull this back, what you're going to expose is this little gland. And again, glands can either look like little beans or they can look like fatty tissue. So as the parotid gland looks like fatty tissue, the mandibular gland, which is this guy right here, he looks like a little bean. So you can see this tiny organ right here this guy right there it looks like a tiny little bean it's to the right or right behind your masseter muscle so review masseter muscle facial nerve this little tube parotid duct leads into the parotid gland all this fatty neck tissue sitting behind that the mandibular gland got this guy right here and that is everything in the cheek want to tie up your pig and here's an example of what we're going for so you want to wrap the string under the tray and back around to his other leg I find that with the legs you want to do it just above the knee because it really solidifies it and I usually tie a knot on one side and then wrap it around on the other so let me show you what that looks like so remember this is the string that is in our bag and we never throw away this string so even when we're done today we're not going to get rid of this string so you want to wrap it underneath wrap it around his wrist in a little knot. Remember these pigs are already dead. They're not going to go running away. So I usually wrap it around in a knot and then kind of like that. And then you want to pull him taut. Taut or very, very tight. So this basically means that there's not a lot of slack here. You don't want him flopping over. The whole point of tying him is to make him nice and open so that we can work without getting interrupted. So then I just wrap and wrap and wrap like that. And he should stay pretty good.
Okay? Nice and taut. So, we're going to continue on from where we cut in the throat, and we're going to start clearing away this area and getting to the larynx and the trachea. So, this part right here, if you feel right in between the arms, it's going to be this hard, like, bone. This is kind of your breastbone right here. So you want to avoid cutting this area for today. We're going to work on this next week when we do the circulatory system, but for today, we kind of want to avoid this area. So right in between the arms, there's a lot of veins and arteries and really important circulatory stuff there that we don't want to cut today. So what you want to do is you want to kind of feel and press with your finger. Just north of that is a fleshy area. And that's where you really want to start cutting. So again, we're going to be moving layer by layer. And I'm going to be looking into the pig as I do this. So I'm looking under the skin to determine what I'm cutting. So there's not going to be a lot in the throat that you can cut away until you get past this muscle. So it's okay to go a little tiny bit faster here, but again, never go straight down. You always want to cut sideways, because if you go straight down, you're going to start cutting at things. The next thing you know, you're going to cut away your larynx, and that's not what you want to do. So we're going to remove all this parotid. This, again, is all just fat and tissue. We're going to remove this nice and slowly. all that and then you can kind of see that it kind of opens up a little bit so after we've got all that fatty tissue this opens up kind of nicely so we want to remove this fatty tissue remove these this right here is actually part of your thymus so this right here is part of your thymus it sits on top we actually don't we typically don't test there for the thymus we usually test under, over the uh, pericardium for the thymus. So it's okay to cut that thymus away. But if you're wondering, that's what, the, that's what we're cutting. Okay. Start to get a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. Clear this nice up. And then here's where we want to start using our probe again. So this is all membrane that we want to get rid of. We're going to lift and scrape, lift and scrape. Now in your book, larynx and trachea are lifted in two different, listed in two different places. They're listed on page 45, but they're also listed again on page 78. And I always find that page 78 is a little bit more helpful. It's going to be removing this stuff. Okay. Now you see this big ball in the throat that we've gotten to? Big giant ball in the throat. That's your larynx. That's your voice box right there. So you don't want to cut into that. You certainly don't want to cut any farther than that. And at the bottom of that is we've got our thyroid gland, which we also don't want to cut away. So here's where you have to start being a little bit more careful. So the pick is really good at not being able to cut organs, but really good at removing this membrane. So scraping, clearing, scraping. Don't go too deep. Okay, there we go. So now what we can see here, so we've got larynx, big ball in the throat, leads down to this bumpy tube. If I can clear some more of this membrane away. There we go. See this bumpy tube, that's your trachea. So larynx, trachea, and then sitting on top of the trachea, look at this little thyroid gland right here again. Glands are either fatty tissue or they're little beans. This guy is a little bean. So, larynx is a big ball in the throat, bumpy tube is the trachea, little bean sitting on top of the bumpy tube, that's your um, thyroid gland. So the next part we're going to move on to is the mouth. So once we've got done with the cheek and the throat, we're going to actually go in and start working on the mouth. Now what's really important here is a lot of people, when they start cutting the mouth, because you have to basically joker him, and cut both sides of his mouth down, a lot of people will go straight into the mandibular gland. So this area typically gets ruined. So you wanna make sure at this point that you've taken all the videos and all the pictures that you need to study. So this is one time that we let you guys and encourage you guys to use your cell phones, not for Facebook, but for pictures and videos. So take pictures of this. You know, point at this, tell me what it is. Point at this, tell me what it is. And then record it for you because later on when you're going back and studying, you won't have these pigs in front of you. 
You'll need to go back to your videos and your pictures and study from those. So I highly encourage that you get all of this area completely taken, all the pictures that you need to, and you've really got that solid before you move on to the mouth. So with that said, if we're totally ready to go, we've taken all of our pictures, we're good. What we're going to do is, again, you're going to joker him, so you're going to cut down the sides of his mouth. And the whole time, you're going to be trying to open his mouth. So he's going to go from this to about this. So he's going to go completely flat, so you really have to follow uh, down the throat instead of into the head. And I'll explain what that means. So this is really the only time that you want to use your scalpel because you're going to be breaking bones. And you're going to be breaking these jaw bones here. So two fingers should be trying to open the mouth or three fingers, however you want to do it. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut not into the brain but down the throat. And that's where a lot of people just start cutting, 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 and they actually cut this way and then take his whole head off. And that's not what we want to do. We want to cut down the throat. So I only want to cut into those bones, and you can hear them break just like that. And these guys are pretty soft, so it should go right through. Because I want to start following the throat, not into the brain. So again, on this side, if you want to try to preserve this, if there's a way to do it, you got to kind of cut high and then around. So see, I avoided the masseter muscle, I avoided the facial nerve, and I kind of cut up towards his eye and then back down. So inside the mouth, what it's going to look like is kind of like this. So we want to cut only these bones that help us get down the throat. So that's another one. You really want to be careful here. You don't want to stab in and then cut yourself. I've actually done that before, and it's not fun. So you want to be very careful in breaking these bones. And they are pretty soft. They should break pretty easily. But you want to make sure that you're cutting the right ones. Again, I don't want to be keep cutting into his head. I don't want to cut down. I want to be prying the mouth open so that you can get down into his throat. So cut off what you need to to get down into his throat. You can hear those little bones breaking. All right, almost there. Okay. Cutting on both sides. There we go. A little gruesome, I know. But there. Once you get all the way down and you see this little flap right here, that's when you can stop cutting. So, now that we've got all the way into his mouth, let's talk about the parts of the mouth. So, these tiny little bumps on the tongue, remember little bump means papilla or papilla, and so these little bumps are the tongue papilla or tongue papillae. So then you've got his tongue, and then you've got all the way down here, these are also tongue papillae. This is your soft palate here, you can see this is the back of the throat or the top of the mouth. That's nice and soft, you can push it, it's kind of squishy. And this here is your hard palate, it's these ridges here that go all the way across. This is your hard palate, and you can tell because it's very, very hard. As soon as it starts to get soft again, this is your soft palate in through here. Alright, so this tiny little flap right here is called the epiglottis. Epi means on top. So basically on top of the glottis. So this tiny little hole the flap is covering goes into the tongue almost. It actually goes down the throat but it looks like it goes into the tongue. And that is your glottis. So this where the probe is right now, that's in the glottis. So on the chest if we were to pin it here and go straight into the hole, that would be the glottis. But if we were to pin it sideways through just the flap, that would be the epiglottis. Now, this main hole that goes all the way down the throat here, this is your esophagus. And this is where, <laughs> bless you, this is where the food goes down. So the food enters the body through the esophagus. So the major hole going all the way down the throat is the esophagus. And then this passageway going up, almost into the soft palate, this is going towards the nose, naso, nasopharynx. So this passageway up in here, this is your nasopharynx. So one more time, tongue papillae, soft palate, hard palate. This is your epiglottis covering the glottis. If I were to pin it here, that would be the epiglottis. Uh, sorry, here would be the epiglottis. In the hole would be the glottis. All the way down the throat would be the esophagus and up towards the nose, nose, naso, nasopharynx. And that is the mouth. The instructions give you very, very clear details and it's in your 
it's in your manual on how to cut depending on your sex. So if you're cutting a male pig, you're going to cut it a certain way, and if you're cutting a female pig, you're going to cut a certain way. So I'm going to start with the female pig right now. Really the most important part is to cut around the umbilical cord. So we want to leave the umbilical cord completely attached, and then we can just cut everything else around it. That's not a problem. In case we open this guy up and there is a lot of excess juices or gross stuff, what I want you guys to do is before it gets all over your tray and gets really gross, take your pig back over to the pig juice bucket and pour it in there. And if you need to rinse off your pig, like if the stomach is opened up, it's not as gross as it sounds, and there's stuff in there, what you can do is you can put a little water inside your pig, squish them around, and then pour all of that juice into the juice bucket, not into the pig bits bucket or the paper towel bucket, but the actual pig juice bucket. And so if you need to rinse off your pig at any time, you can do that and then pour all of that liquid never ever ever in the sink, always into the bucket marked pig juices. Alright, so with that let's get started. So we've got our happy pig tied up, we've already done the cheek, the throat, and the mouth, and now we're going to move on to the body cavity. Remember, we're going to avoid this area right here, this is where that breastplate is, this is where his ribs are, this is where all this important circulatory system is. So we're going to avoid that. Now the book has you starting incisions like 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. If you'd like to follow that, that's absolutely fine, there's nothing wrong with those instructions. I find that they take a little bit longer than it is necessary to open the body cavity. So what's important about the body cavity is it's surrounded by a diaphragm. So they, in acting they say, breathe through your diaphragm, you know, and you're supposed to increase your breath through your stomach. And that's because you can actually fill this entire cavity up with air. So your organs are not covered in gook and it's not jarbled around in there. It's actually very neat and organized and nothing's really attached, at least not the skin anyway. So what I do is I usually come over here to the side and you can already feel it. If you pinch this skin right here, there's really nothing behind it. It's just skin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to feel this right here, and then I'm going to poke this through. Be sure not to poke yourself, because I can feel that there's nothing between here and that little probe. So then I'm going to lift this up, and I'm going to cut it, just like so. And so what you can see is if we look inside the pig, you can see the diaphragm. So this thick membrane right here, Underneath the skin, that is the diaphragm. So if we start to pull this away and cut this away, you actually expose the diaphragm. So this is why I always pinch that skin so I can feel, oh, there's nothing important in there. I'm not going to uh, damage anything if I cut through it. What I want you guys to do is, before you actually break into the body cavity, is to get a good look at the diaphragm. So it's this thick, muscular, layer that surrounds this whole bottom body cavity. So that's the first thing on your list, the diaphragm right here. Now, if we are to puncture through the diaphragm, and remember the diaphragm is fairly thick, so we're able to puncture through, you cut all that open, what you notice is that it opens up into like a cavern. So now there's nothing attached, the skin is not attached at any kind of membrane. And that's why you always want to pull it all the way over to the side because you don't want to go deep down. You never want to go down because, you, again, you'll cut up organs and stuff. So if you pull all the way to the side, you can look and see that there's actually nothing attached. So I can cut around this and not damage anything. And then you open it up and you've got a nice open hole into the body. So now you can look and lift around and be like, okay, well, there's nothing here I'm going to cut. There's nothing here I'm going to cut and you can start making slightly larger incisions. You will have to break some bones over here. These are ribs, but they usually cut off pretty easily. Again, cutting, cutting, cutting. So this is our umbilical cord and we want to avoid that because we've got a female here. So we want to cut a nice circle around her umbilical cord and cut all this excess skin away. And remember, we're always removing excess skin because if it doesn't need to be there, she's going to get in our way when we're trying to look at stuff. Cutting all this away. So this is what I mean about that gross stuff on the inside. So we've got a little bit of food that's probably leaked out, a little bit of dirt, and some of that liquid again. So we can pour this all this out. And if it really bothers you or gets gross, what you can do is put some water in your pig, swish them around, and then try to get this stuff into the pig juices bin. So that's what I mean by that gross stuff on the inside. So then we keep cutting. All the way to the other side. 
Again, there's nothing that you're going to hurt as long as you don't go too deep. So again, you can kind of see the thickness here. That's your skin on the outside and then this thick layer, this darker layer on the inside, that's all your diaphragm surrounding the whole cavity. Okay. And then we can probably remove some of this excess skin from right around the umbilical cord. Just want to make sure we don't damage her reproductive organs because we're going to look at that in two weeks. So all these fleshy bits, remember, these are the pig parts. This will go into the pig parts bucket, and not the pig juices bucket, and not the paper towel bucket, but the pig parts bucket. So very carefully, you want to cut that. Okay. All right. So then what you see, if you see that our umbilical cord is actually attached. It's attached down here with these arteries. Remember, pink is arteries. And then this is our urinary bladder. And this goes up to the umbilical cord. And this is where the urine is stored, but we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But what the first thing I want you guys to do is once you've got this nice open cavity, is I actually want you to cut this blue uh, vein right here. So this leads from your liver to the umbilical cord. So this is our umbilical vein. So that's on your sheet as umbilical vein. So you can see that you can't really get by, you can't really get under all that good stuff. So if you cut it just slightly, I can see, okay, here's where it was going and here's where it's coming from. I can always flap it back and be like, right, that's where it was supposed to be. Now that I've seen the orientation, I can flap this up and you can really start to get into your organs and your small intestine and stuff. Okay, so basically what we have here is kind of a map of our intestines and basically what's going on in our body cavity. So if you can think of it like that, you can basically trace your way around and it'll kind of give you a better idea of where everything is and what everything is next to. So in case you don't even know what it is on the test, at least you can deduce a little bit and kind of knock out what the ones that you for sure know it's not. So we're going to start at the top. This is the liver, so we're basically about right here in the body cavity. If we were to lift this lobe up on the right hand side, we're going to have the gallbladder, this little deflated sac underneath the liver. It's going to feed down into this common bile duct here which enters into the stomach. Basically this deflated sac underneath the liver is your stomach. If you were to lift that up, you see all this fatty glandy, it's usually white or gray, that's your pancreas. It goes on both sides, it's got two lobes. On the left hand side, always, if we're looking at it like this, we're always on the left hand side. This is gonna be our spleen, it's that red tongue looking thing that comes out. And then coming off the stomach, the first part of the small intestine, Coming over to the right is going to be your duodenum. So coming off the stomach, this first part is the duodenum. And then you're going to come down into all this what looks like small intestine stuff. And this out here is if you were to spread this out, it's got all this connective tissue. And this connective tissue is known as mesentery. And then out here, the actual uh, intestine itself is known as jejunum. And jejunum uses mesentery to absorb things, which is why all of this mesentery is here. So if you were to follow this down and around, what you basically come to, again, is this small intestine looking thing, but it kind of balls up into this little ball by itself. It's got a little mesentery, but not a lot of mesentery. And this right here is what's known as the ileum. So this little ball of small intestine that kind of falls off by itself is the ileum. Separate than the jejunum, but the same type of material. Now, this spiral looking colon thing right in the middle is going to be your spiral colon. Makes a lot of sense. This is also considered the large intestine in these guys. Don't write large intestine or small intestine because that's not on your test. Remember, only write what's on this sheet, which is ileum, jejunum, etc. So, in between the spiral colon and the ileum is a kind of little dead end where all this connects and continues and connects and continues. There's a little dead end section, and this little dead end section right here is known as the cecum. So the cecum, in humans it actually have the appendix off of it, but in these pigs it's just this little kind of dead end and that's what's known as the cecum. It can be kind of hard to find, but if you look between the, the spiral colon and the ileum, it's usually right there. Now, on either side we've got our bean looking things, these are our kidneys. Sitting on top, on the inside of the kidneys, is this tiny little flap known as the adrenal gland. Remember, uh or ad means on top and renal means kidney on top of the kidney. 
Um, coming in and out of the kidneys are these two veins and arteries. What, sorry, one vein and artery. You've got your renal vein and renal artery, depending whether they're pink or blue. And then just below them, this white squiggly looking thing coming out and going down towards the urinary bladder. That is your ureter. That's your ureter, which comes out of the kidneys and goes to the urinary bladder. Coming down from all of this intestine is our rectum. So it basically kind of looks like this colony looking thing, which comes down the length of the body and then out towards the anus. Okay, so now that we've cleaned up this area, we're gonna start breaking into the chest cavity. Again, we're avoiding this area up here until week two, where we get into the circulatory system. But this area down here, this is where our lungs and our heart is, and that's what we do want to expose today. So, same kind of thing. I always start coming in on the sides, either over here or over here on one of the sides, because the only thing you're gonna hit on these sides are the lungs. The lungs are very big and they're very obvious. So if we nick one of the little lungs, that's gonna be okay. So I'm peeling over here, and I'm kind of cutting through the ribs, and just like, just like we did with the body cavity, if I were to cut through here, what you can see is it opens up into its own little cavity. So if I were to cut these ribs away, you can see that this kind of opens up. And see, we nicked a lung, but that's okay. You can get right into there. So once we can see it, then we know we're not gonna hurt anything. So once you open up that little pocket, then you can start cutting a little bit more vigorously because you're not going to hurt anything because you can watch what you're cutting. If you'd like to go layer by layer, that's, all, that's fine as well. You can basically just remove these layers of skin here. And what you see is you see all the muscles and then you'll clear away the ribs. And you can do that too. That's fine. It does take a little bit longer though. But if you're worried about cutting something and you're nervous, that's okay. Remember this is three hours, study at your own pace labs. Go as slow as you'd like. Just make sure that you see everything before the last day, week three. All right. Okay, so now we've exposed. We've got our lungs here. So this is a little lung right there. This is a little lung right here. This is just some more ribs. You can see where the diaphragm ends here. So that's going to flop down and cover the whole body of cavity. And then this chest cavity up here. Got some more gook in here. That's all right. Just clear that off. And then that chest cavity here is separate. Nice open chest cavity. These little triangular things, these are our lungs right here. And we've reached our heart. Our heart is surrounded right now by this little membrane that I'm lifting up. That little membrane is called the pericardium. Pericardium, para means around, cardia means heart, pericardium. Membrane that surrounds the heart. So that's an important one. This is where we want to start being really careful because we don't want to cut into any of that circulatory system and any of those veins and arteries that we want to look at later. So right now I'm just removing this top layer of muscle and skin and being very careful not to cut the arteries and stuff underneath. See how shallow they are? You can be very, very careful in through here. Okay, so we want to lift up these ribs and you want to cut right underneath them because you can actually cut the ribs away without damaging the thymus or the pericardium. Okay. Now, if at any point you do cut away something that's important, it is not the end of the world. There are lots of resources and information online. This pig dissection is very, very common. So you can look at other websites. They've got practice tests. 
they've got examples, they've got lots and lots of things that you can always look at at line. So if you do not understand here in class, maybe your pig didn't have a really good thymus, you can always Google these things and Google images on what they're supposed to look like and they will absolutely help you. Your book is the best resource for that because they have really, really good, clear pictures. Now, not all the pigs are going to look similar. Bobby's pig is going to look different than Jenny's pig, so you need to know what the different pigs look like. So this is where we encourage people to walk around the labs, especially if you have a female, you need to go look at what a male looks like. When we get down to the reproductive system, you are responsible for both. It doesn't matter what sex of the pig you got, you are always responsible for both. So now that we've removed all of these ribs here, we're going to leave this central section alone because again that's where all those veins and arteries and really important stuff is and we don't want to cut those. So again this is another good time to use our pick. So we're going to start picking away this membrane, picking away this membrane. Okay. Now. What you can see here is this, this membrane, again, is our pericardium. This membrane is actually a very, very tough membrane. So we've already broken through it, which is nice. But otherwise, if you have the pick, it might be easier just to snip a little bit of this pericardium membrane off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it, but I'm going to leave it almost all intact. I'm going to cut it in half so I can flop it open or back and I'm going to leave it intact because depending on whether we're above or below the pericardium will matter what organ we're talking about. And again, you can always cut away areas that are blocking you so you can access everything. So now I've cut this membrane so what I can do is I can lay it flat again just like this or I can fold it back. So when I lay it flat when I peel away these lungs, what you see on the top right here, this little flap, this darker part, so this membrane is a little bit whitish, you could see here, mostly kind of gray. This glandy guy looking right here, this is our thymus. Remember we had a little thymus up here? This is the thymus where we really test you guys on it. So this thymus here is sitting on top of the pericardium, on top of the heart. So this is why it's important to know are we below or above the pericardium. Because above the pericardium, like we are now, is this thymus. This whole thymus right here. If we were to move this pericardium back and flap it like this, underneath this pericardium, let me pull all this back. And we cut a little bit of this. Okay. Got some more gook. So again, if at this point you want to pour some water on this to help alleviate the smell or the uh, gross squishies, that's okay. So what you can see here, now that we're under the pericardium, we've pulled this back, this is an oracle. So there's one here and then one on this side of the heart as well, right here. And these are two flaps that sit under the pericardium but on top of the heart. So that's why you need to know whether you're under the pericardium or on top of the pericardium, whether you're talking about the thymus or whether you're talking about these oracles here. And these oracles are just part of the atrium. Um, so you've got one on top of here and one on top of here for the heart. And then we clean off this gunk. And that is the chest cavity. In the chest cavity, again, this is our heart right here. We've got our lungs on either side, these big triangular looking guys. Surrounding the body cavity, which is this membrane here, this thick musculature membrane that goes all the way around, that is your diaphragm. The giant blue guy in our body is our liver, our liver, so it's got all these different lobes, but it's all the same consistency and roughly the same color, so this is our liver, so this whole thing is our liver. Remember, we've got the umbilical vein, which attached to our umbilical cord. If we lift up, we lift up the liver very, very gently. And you always want to use some kind of tool. You never want to use your finger because your finger can actually be very damaging. So if we're going to lift up, we're going to try not to pierce. We're going to hold this here. But if you lift up on the right hand side, you're going to see this little deflated sac here under the liver. That little deflated sac is your gallbladder. So the liver produces bile. The 
gallbladder stores the bile. And again, it comes out this tiny little tube going towards the stomach. And that's your common bile duct. So that's where it sends the bile. This big deflated sac underneath the liver here has to be our stomach. It's usually right next to this little tongue looking guy, this little feather tongue looking thing, and that is our spleen. So that's always going to be on the left hand side. That's our spleen. And then if we kind of gently lift these up, what we've got underneath is we've got this fatty kind of white bulbousy material. That's right up in here. And this is one of the lobes of our pancreas. So day one, your pancreas should look just like this. By day two and day three, it gets a little bit degraded. So you want to make sure that you get lots of pictures of the pancreas and really make sure you know what it looks like because that guy has a tendency to shrivel up and kind of be hard to see. So next is everybody's favorite part, the small intestines. So if you look on our sheet, small intestines is not one of the vocab words. So if you answer small intestines on the practical, you'll get it wrong. Because what we want you to do is we actually want you to, to identify the different parts of the small intestine. And there are basically, I don't know, five parts. So we're going to start over here at our stomach. Remember this big sac guy. And we're going to follow it down. So where the stomach starts going into the small intestine, you've got this kind of hard, bulbousy, uh, kind of colon looking thing right here. And that's your duodenum. Or as people say, duodenum. So this is your duodenum. And this is basically the first part of your small intestines. So it's very distinct. It's got this almost hard part right here. So this is a sac, deflated sac. This is hard, and this is where it first starts, is your duodenum. So your duodenum then leads over here, and you've got all of this intestine-looking stuff here. And what you can see is it kind of separates up into three distinct areas. One is this spiral looking colon thing and that is just that it's your spiral colon so you can see it's spiraled and it looks just like a colon so it makes sense to call that the spiral colon over here we've got all of this connective tissue so you can see when I laid out just like this it's all of this connective tissue holding in these small intestine and that's because this is the jejunum out here and the jejunum is responsible for nutrient and water absorption so this mesentery here, which is our connective tissue, all this mesentery, is actually aiding in absorption. So this is where our nutrients are coming to be absorbed. Okay? So then you follow it down and down and down, and still all this mesentery, 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 until finally you get to this area where there's very little mesentery, and in fact it kind of falls off onto this little ball by itself. This little ball by itself, with very little mesentery or connective tissue, is called the ileum. So again, out here, all of this is jejunum. So if we were to pin this, it would be jejunum. If we were to pin this in here, that's mesentery, including our mesenteric arteries and veins. And then over here, it kind of falls off into this own little ball right there, and that's your ileum. So this whole area is ileum. And again, that's still for absorption of nutrients and water, but it's not as much. So most of the absorption happens over here in the jejunum. Now in between your ileum, and your spiral colon, because everything's connected, so everything keeps flowing and flowing and flowing, you're going to find a little dead end. Here it is. And we've got this little dead end guy. Where you can kind of see that, yes, he's attached by a little connective tissue right there, but really he's this, like, dead end guy. So if I break that, you can see he just ends right here. And that's your cecum. This is your cecum right here. So it's this little dead end guy. So again, we've got jejunum, we've got ileum, we've got our cecum, our spiral colon, our mesentery. So that is all the small and large intestines. This would be considered our large intestines, and this would all be considered our small intestine right here. All right, so then if you peel all this up, again, we got a little water in here, so we'll just dump him out. Remember to keep the legs nice and taut. If your pig comes undone, you can always just re-tighten. There we go. Okay. So back here, if we lift all this up, you can see this is our rectum right here. So this is our rectum leading down from all the large intestine, small intestine. This is where um, non-digestible material is removed. And then it leads to the anus, which again is where all of that is literally removed from the body. Okay. So if we move over here, 
basically what we have is if we kind of break some of this tissue up, here again, this is what your probe is really good for. You can see these big round bean looking guys on either side, right? Those are your kidneys. You've heard like kidney beans? Well, that's because they look like beans. So these giant guys right here are your kidneys. Again, this is our pancreas. And if we kind of pick through this connective tissue, what we're going to get to is a very small gland sitting on top of the kidney and that's going to be our adrenal gland. So a uh, or ad means on top and renal means kidney. So the adrenal gland sits on top of the kidney. And for whatever reason I always find that one side has a better one than the other. Typically I find it's on this side. But if you can't find it on this side you might want to go to the other side. So what we've got is because I'm pulling this away this should actually be all connected. So actually our adrenal gland is this little white flap right here. This tiny little flap, and see I've kind of broken it a little bit right there. Which is why you always want to go very slow. So this guy would be, if he's sitting like this, like if I stop pulling him apart, he would be sitting right on top the inside upper of the kidney. So the adrenal gland is always going to be right about here. So this little white flap right there actually sits right here. And that's your adrenal gland. Um, and I think again we've got the umbilical arteries here. This is our urinary bladder. And I think that's it for the body cavity. Okay guys, now we're going to review what we've done in week one. So, starting in our cheek muscle, basically you've got this large circular muscle here, that's your masseter muscle. You've got your parotid gland, which is all this fatty tissue back here. You've got your mandibular gland, which is the tiny bean-looking gland just to the right of the masseter muscle, hidden under all this parotid. So this little round guy right here, that's our mandibular gland. You've got the sublingual gland located down here that is under the tongue, basically, right underneath the chin. And then right here, going under here, under the masseter muscle, this is our salivary ducts right here, which leads back into the parotid gland that we see back here. Now, going into our mouth, basically you've got your palate here. This is bumpy top of the roof part of the mouth. And then if you open nice and wide, you can see this giant hole that goes all the way down the throat. That's the esophagus. That's where the food goes down. You see this tiny little flap which covers this little hole that appears to almost go into the tongue. It doesn't quite, but it appears to. This hole is the glottis, and this flap is the epiglottis. So if we were to pin it in here just like that, that would be the glottis. But if we were to pin it sideways going through just the flap, that would be the epiglottis. And now going up towards the nose, we've got this passageway here. Up towards the nose area here, think nose, naso nasopharynx. So this right here, this passageway underneath here is our nasopharynx. Okay, moving on to the body cavity. Remember we've got this nice thick membrane here. This thick, thick membrane surrounds the whole body cavity, this lower body cavity here. That's your diaphragm. That's the diaphragm. Now right above that is our chest cavity, which you can see here. I'm going to tuck this guy back under here. Okay. We've got our chest cavity here. In the center of that chest cavity is our heart. This is our heart right here. You can see the lungs on either side, these little triangle looking things right there. Now if you push this membrane that surrounds the heart, you can see this membrane right here. This membrane that sits on top of the heart, that's the pericardium. So sitting on top of the pericardium is this gland right here, and that's your thymus. So you remember, if you were underneath the pericardium, you would find auricles here, but we're on top of the pericardium. So we're going to find our thymus, which lies right there, it's flat looking material right there. Now if we were to move up from there, right above our circulatory system in here, we've got this little bean looking gland here, and this is our thyroid gland. And that's going to sit right underneath our larynx and our trachea. 
This is the little thyroid gland right there. Okay, moving back down to our body cavity right here, we've got the giant looking lobe thing here. Four different lobes of the liver. Again, this is our liver. This big blue guy right here taking up most of the space in our lower body cavity. That is our liver. Now if you lift up the liver very carefully, you're going to find this little deflated sac right here. This little deflated sac, I'll move the spleen out of the way. This little deflated sac guy right there, this is our stomach. Now connecting to the stomach and sitting right below it, it's this tongue looking flap guy. And that's our spleen. This is our spleen right here. Okay, and then if you keep moving down, what you'll basically find is you'll find your intestines. So we've got all of this small intestines here. And you can tell it's small intestines because it's kind of thin and foldy and it's just basically wrapped all along here. And that is all your small intestine right there. Now in between your intestines and your stomach, you peel this back here and you can actually pick some of this membrane away, you've got this, let's clear this over here, you've got this white bulbous -y material here. All of this white fatty looking stuff right here, that's your pancreas. So this guy all right here, this fatty, and there's two lobes. There's going to be a lobe over here and a lobe over here, but this one's always easiest to see right underneath the spleen. That's the pancreas right there. Now if you look on the other side of our pig, turn this so you can see a little bit, Underneath our liver, now remember we lift our liver up, we've pushed our stomach down, you're going to see this tiny little deflated sac right here. That little deflated sac is the gallbladder. Remember the liver produces the bile, the gallbladder stores the bile, and then it is transported to the stomach through the bile duct right there. Okay, so again this is our little bile duct, leading the bile from the gallbladder to the stomach. Okay, going back to our intestine, We've got this small intestine right here. This is our spiral colon right here. If you look right in between the spiral colon on the pig's left hand side, what you're going to find is all this intestine connects and keeps going and keeps squiggling, but there's a tiny little dead end. Now this tiny little dead end guy, which is this guy right here, sticking out. You can see he doesn't really go anywhere. It's kind of like this little dead end loop. That's your cecum right there. That's your cecum. All right, now if we're going to lift all this up, coming down from all this small intestine right here is our colon. I'm sorry, our rectum. This is our rectum. Coming down from all this, we get our spiral colon, our small intestine, and then leading down the rectum, which leads out to the anus. It's time to move on to the central nervous system. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to start with the pig kind of facing down. So I've got his legs spread here so that he's nice and secure and he's not going to roll away. And what you want to do is you want to try to grab with this fat around the neck and then make a little incision so that you can start cutting away at the skin. So once I've made a little incision I can kind of look in and see what I'm doing. And again you're always going to cut at this connective tissue so that you re remove a nice clean layer of skin just like that. So we can kind of see what we're doing and now we can keep going in. So you want to cut forward towards his nose and then around just like that. Remove that skin, and then what you want to do is you probably want to cut a little bit more away so you can really see what you're doing. And in the front, there's going to be a little soft spot in the skull, and that's actually where we want to cut through the bone. So you can kind of feel it's harder, it's harder. Right about here is where it gets a little bit soft, and that's that soft spot in the skull. So that's where we actually want to try to cut through. So I'm going to press down just till I break in. You don't want to press down too hard. And again, you don't really want to use the scalpel for this. You really want to use the tweezers. And then you want to kind of lift up, make tiny little incisions until you can get a piece of the skull and then start to snip that away. OK, 
Okay, and again, we're always looking, lifting, and cutting. Nice and slow so that we don't mess anything up. And then you can actually see right there, we've exposed some of the brain. Now be very careful with the brain. If you touch it or press, put any pressure on it, it will actually smush the brain. So you want to be careful once you remove this skull that you don't have any kind of pressure pushing down on that brain. And that first lobe right there, what we're uncovering now is the cerebral cortex. So this all under here is the cerebral cortex. So let me kind of reposition the pig and we're just cutting off a little bit. It's okay if you take little pieces of the cerebral cortex off. Don't, you know, don't worry, don't stress. You'll be able to see what it looks like. So basically we're gonna keep cutting this all around until we can expose the brain. Doing this upside down, so I'm cutting a little bit into the cerebral cortex, but that's okay. Got a lot of it. I'm doing this kind of fast, but you guys want to always remember that you go nice and slow during all your dissections. So then, what you want to do is once you've got that whole thing exposed, so you want to start cutting down towards the spine. I want to actually start cutting down into the neck area. If you'd like to remove the ears, you can remove the ears if they kind of get in your way. Just cut them like that. And then you can lift this fatty part here and start cutting into the neck. So what you want to be careful is you never want to go too deep too quickly because again we've got a lot of really fragile stuff in there that we don't want to harm. So this top layer, this tough layer of skin you can cut off easily but after that you want to start going nice and slow. Okay so after some extensive cu cutting we've removed some of this bone that's been covering here and so after we've removed it and we've cut all through that you can see this kind of bluish area and that's how you know that you've actually gotten into the cerebellum. So this here, the base of the cerebral cortex, which is kind of falling apart, so again, be very careful with it, is this cerebellum right here. This is a nice example of our cerebellum. Right okay, so now that we've cleared everything away and we've opened up our brain, what you can see here is we've got these two lobes of the cerebral cortex right here. And then behind this guy right here, this and everything underneath here is that our cerebellum. So this squishy part right under here is our cere cerebellum at the base of our cerebral cortex. And then you move down. What we've done is we've actually removed one of these vertebrates. You can see this vertebrate plate right here. So if you remove one of these, there's another one right there, you get this squishy part right up in here. And that right there is your medulla oblongata. So that's basically the base of the skull right here right behind, underneath basically the spine. So then if you were to continue down, again this is your spinal cord going all the way down here, so if we removed and cut all this away, you can see the spinal cord right here, and in between these little ridges that you can see, those are our spinal nerves. So right in there. Okay, so again we've got our cerebral cortex, this guy here. This part right at the base of that, that is our cerebellum, Going just below that, you can see this part right in here that's underneath our spine. That right there is the medulla oblongata. And then you follow it down, 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 and again you've got your spinal cord down here with your little spinal nerves in between. Okay guys, so now we're going to go a little bit into the circulatory system so you guys understand the pathway of blood through the heart and that will help you identify some of these organs and these vessels. Okay, so we're going to start over here. We've got our four chambers of the heart. You've got your atriums up here and your ventricles down here. This is on the right-hand side because we're, say, we're the pig. So again, this is our right-hand side. So you're going to start here, the vena cava, either the superior, inferior, also known as the cranial or caudal. Cranial because it's above the heart towards the head and caudal because it's below towards the tail, like a caudal fin on a fish. And so we're basically going to feed deoxygenated blood, which has sucked all the oxygen out, 
all through the organs. This is returned deoxygenated into the right atrium, down the tricuspid valve, to the right ventricle, up and out the pulmonary valve, to the pulmonary artery. So think of this as kind of bypassing or going behind. The pulmonary artery, remember this is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. So arteries definition means away from the heart. So this is the pulmonary artery because it is still an artery, it's going away from the heart, but this is the only one that actually carries deoxygenated blood, which is an important one. So then we're going to go to the lungs. In the lungs we're actually going to find these capillaries, these small capillaries. Good? Yeah. Okay. And what you, basically what's going to happen is these are very thin membranes. So the deoxygenated blood is going to flow in. And as it flows over all these thin membrane gaps, this is where the oxygen is actually um, absorbed into the blood. And that's where you get that transition from deoxygenated blood to oxygenated blood. So then we're going to return in the pulmonary vein. Vein because it's going from the body to the heart. But it is oxygenated. So this is the only vein that has oxygenated blood, which is also important. So then we're going to go into the left atrium, down the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle. We're going to go up and out the aortic valve, towards the aorta where we send oxygenated blood all over the body. This first little branch right here off the aortic arch that you can see, this little branch is known as the branchiocephalic trunk or branchiocephalic artery. So again, this is that first branch off the aorta. Guys, we're going to continue on to the rest of our circulatory system. So basically, we're, to let you know where we're at, we're basically right here in the throat, and we're going to work our way down. So you've got the big ball in the throat, that's the larynx, feeds down into the bumpy throat, bumpy tooth in your throat, that's the trachea. At the base of that is a little bean-shaped guy, that's your thyroid gland, sitting right at the base of that. Now on either side of your throat, there's going to be three different vessels, one artery and two veins. And what you can see is this is going to be this big red one, which is our arteries, our carotid artery. You kind of heard, you know, they've cut the jugular, cut the carotid. These are major arteries going up to your, brain, to your vein. So this red one is going to be your carotid artery. And then these two blue ones on either side of the throat are going to be your jugular veins. So remember, the red ones are the carotid and the blue ones are the jugulars. Now, for the rest of this part here, we're going to be talking mostly about veins. So when you cut to this intersection, it's really easy to think of this whole system as kind of confusing, but if you break it down, it's actually quite simple. So we're going to call our jugular veins here, we're going to call that one. So again, we're not going to ask you the difference between internal, external. Your T is probably not going to ask you the difference between right and left because students get confused whether it's your right or the pig's right. Just remember the order. So we've got jugular vein one. The first branch off that jugular vein here is our cephalic. Remember, same on both sides. We're just talking about this side. So we've got one jugular, two cephalic. Three is this second branch here, but only from here to here. Once it branches again, this is your subclavian, is three, but four becomes your subscapular, and five becomes your auxiliary. So if you can count one jugular, two cephalic, three subclavian, four subscapular, and five auxiliary, you guys will pretty much be good for all of these veins in this area right here. Now, remember the central intersection right here is actually your branchiocephalic vein. And the way you can think of that is, think of branches of the cephalic vein. You've got your cephalic right here, you've got all these branches, so this is the branch of the cephalic right there, your branchiocephalic vein. We're back in the mesentery, again this is all our jejunum out here, this is our mesentery here. If you peel back some of this connective tissue, what you get is these arteries and these veins in the mesentery. And these are your mesenteric arteries and your mesenteric vein. Makes a lot of sense. Arteries and veins of the mesentery. So, likewise with that thinking, we've got our kidneys. Remember, kidney, real means kidney. So anything adrenal means on top of the kidney. Renal vein and arteries are going to be the veins and arteries that are going in and out of the kidney. So this guy right here, should be blue, but he's actually white, so this is going to be your renal vein. And this guy right here should be pink, and that's going to be your renal artery. If they're not dyed too well in your pig, that's okay. On the day of the test, we'll make sure that it's very obvious whether we're talking about the vein or the artery. You can see a little bit of pink here. That could be considered a renal artery, but again, day of the test, 
just remember renal means kidney so the little veins in the arteries coming in and out of the kidneys are going to be your renal veins and arteries depending on whether they're blue or pink finishing up the last part of our circulatory system we come to the iliac and the femoral so there's a lot of places that these arteries branch but you have to make sure that you're looking at the right branch so right around where the umbilical artery starts to kind of come up see how it goes straight down and then this basically like 90 degree turn right about there is where you're going to find the iliac so that's the first place you want to look it's a major branch off the aorta so the aorta just like the vena cava runs the length of the body so yes they're up here but they're also running the length of the body so when they're back here they're going to branch and this branch right here between here and here this is what's known as the iliac right here different than the ilium this is the iliac and this is the iliac artery right here and that's going to go from here to here the iliac is going to run down from the aorta which is all behind here which is behind the rectum as soon as it branches you can see right here it branches and splits into this like y formation this is where they become the femoral so this is your femoral and your femoral right here and again on these tests you don't have to worry about the internal versus external left versus right you don't ever have to worry about that just know that before the branch is the iliac and after the branches are your femorals Okay, so this is a diagram from the Biology 101 Pig Dissection Manual, and this is on page 90 if you need a reference, but this is a really good cartoon diagram of the female reproductive system, so it really gives us an idea of what we're looking for based on uh, the differences. So we're going to start at the top. We've got our vena cava, we've got our aorta, we've got our kidneys, which we've got our little tiny adrenal gland sitting on top of. Just below that, leading out here, we've got our ureter. Our ureter again filters down from the kidneys into the urinary bladder. This is our umbilical cord up here with our umbilical arteries and our umbilical vein. So leading down here on our aorta side, you can see this leads into our umbilical arteries. And then right around where this connects, you've got your ureter and your aortas connecting to the umbilical arteries, you're going to have the reproductive system. So then we've got our Y-like structure here. So you can see on the very outsides of the arms of the Y is our little, our little bean-shaped ovary guy. Sitting right on top of that is our oviduct. And then it leads down into the squiggly line, squiggly line, squiggly line here on either side. And those are the arms of the Y, or what's known as the horns of the uterus. So these squiggles are all the horns of the uterus where it connects and actually leads down to the body of the Y. This is our body of the uterus right here. So this is horns of the uterus out here and body of the uterus right here. Now if we were to follow that down, 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 we actually reach the vagina right here. And this is our vagina, which leads out to our urogenital opening, surrounded by our genital paplia, which is this little structure here. And what's really important to notice is this kind of 180 degree flip where you see off of the vagina right here is actually this little vessel known as the urethra leading up to the urinary bladder and again this is where urine is transported from the bladder out her urogenital opening so this 180 degree flip right here is the urethra off of the vagina now if you guys study this picture it will really give you a good idea of where everything is and where everything's attached so this is really really useful in study All right. So remember that we cut around the umbilical cord for the females. So she's got no reproductive organs down here. So what we want to do is we want to fold this urinary bladder here. We want to fold that down. And again, these are our umbilical arteries because they're going up the umbilical cord. Our umbilical vein was coming out of the liver and going to the umbilical cord, this right here. That's your umbilical vein. And at the base of that, if you were to follow this all the way down, what you're going to see is you're going to see this nice squiggly line right here. And this squiggly line is this is the horn of the uterus. So this whole thing right here is the horns of the uterus. And you have to think of the uterus as a Y. This is our horns of the uterus, squiggly, squiggly Ys. At each end, we've got this tiny little ovary. Kind of looks like a little tiny bean. Lots of things in the body look like beans, but this is the smallest. Okay? Sitting on top of that, this tiny little, tiny little fleshy part right here, sitting on top of the ovary, that's the oviduct. 
So that guy's sitting right on top of the ovary. And then we've got our horns of our uterus. If we were to pull this down, this becomes our body of the uterus right here. So this is like the base of the Y, branch of the Y, base of the Y. If we were to follow this down here, and you would have to cut all through here, basically what we're going to find down here is the vagina. So all you have to do is follow it from the base of or the body of the uterus, follow it down, down, down to the vagina. And it ends back here in our urogenital opening. So we pull back the tail, and you can see our mammary, our uh, genital paplia right here, and that hole is her urogenital opening which leads to the vagina. Now, just like in males, there is a small 90 degree bend that leads up to the urinary bladder, and that is what's known as the urethra. So if we kind of clear off this space here, what you find is there's going to be a small tube that heads up, and that's what we have right here. So this tube going to the urinary bladder from the uterus and the vagina is going to be our urethra. Alright, so the male reproductive system is a little bit more complex and there's a couple more things going on, but it's the same general pattern. So again, we start up here with the kidneys, we've got our adrenal gland, uh, renal arteries and veins, coming out of the kidneys, going to the urinary bladder is your ureters on either side, okay, basically following this down to the urinary bladder. And the difference is, is right around here where we would have our ovaries and our urethra, is instead we have this uh, vas deferens. So these branches of the Y here are our vas deferens. This body of the Y, which would be in females, the body of the uterus, in males is the seminal vesicles. So this branch of the body of the Y doesn't go all the way down, it stops right here, but you still got this body of the Y and these two branches going towards either side. So again, this is your seminal vesicles, and then out here, these two branches are your vas deferens. You follow this down, basically you're entering this scrotal sac right here, and inside the scrotal sac, if you were to follow this down, this leads down into your testy, which would be the uh, ovary in females, but it's the testy in male, and this epi epididymis is sitting on top, just like the oviduct is sitting on top in the females, this epididymis is sitting on top surrounding this testy. Now this is inside the scrotal sac. And if your pig is well developed, then it will be inside the scrotal sac. But sometimes, because these are fetal pigs and have not developed sexually, they will be up here. So they will be sitting in the same spots as the um, uterus and the ovaries would be. So you need to be able to differentiate between a male pig and a female pig based on not only the seminal vesicles, the vas deferens, which look different than the uterus and the horns and the body, but whether or not the scrotal sacs are present. An easy way to tell on the test is we'll always make the general paplia obvious. So if you're looking at it and you can't tell if they're undescended testes or ovaries, if you just look towards this general paplia, if you don't see one, then you have to know it's a female, those must be ovaries. Okay, so just like in the females, the male's urethra also does this 90 degree or depending on how you're looking at it, 180 degree flip. So coming down from the urinary bladder, we've got this uh, urethra right here, and then it's gonna flip. So this 90 degree turn right here goes from the urethra to the penis. So the easiest way to do it is start at the urogenital opening, which is found just below the umbilical cord. So there's going to be this space in between. You can actually break that membrane up and cut that space away, because it's all just skin and muscle. And you can expose this tube here, and this tube here is going to be the penis. And so you can actually rub your fingers back and forth across it, and it'll feel like a small tube. And I know that sounds silly, but you guys are in college, you can handle this. It's just a little tiny tube, and so you can find it and then cut away all that excess skin, and then you'll expose this penis here. So this penis is gonna then come and go into this 180 degree whoop, this flip, and as soon as it goes through that flip, it becomes the urethra right here. And that's leading back up to the urinary bladder. Okay, so that is basically all the ones you need to know. There is a gland behind the urethra right before it does that 180 whoop, 
Um, and that is your bulbo urethral gland. A lot of people cut this away, so it's not a big deal if you didn't find it because it's gonna look a little, bit, remember it's a gland, so it's gonna look kinda like a bean, but a lot of people do cut that away if you're looking for the penis and the urethra. All right, we're gonna have to cut some skin around. All right, so we are carefully cutting into the male reproductive system. So what we have done is we have cut, we would followed the urogenital opening down and we found this nice tube, and this is our penis right here, it's in a space separate from the urinary bladder, which is important to know. And what we do is we follow it down, and this is our scrotum again here. And what we've done is this was actually tucked in here, and what you can actually do is you can pull it very gently, and this whole sac will actually come out here. So let's see if we can do that just as good on the other side. So we've got this, and then you just pull this guy. I know, sorry guys. And he comes right out. Okay? So these would be our scrotum, or our scrotal sacs. Together they're a scrotum. Individually they're a scrotal sacs. And now what we'll have to do is we'll actually have to open this guy up and find our testy. So again, an easy way of doing it is if you kind of feel around, you can almost feel around for the actual testy if they're well developed. This guy actually has a rather large scrotum so it should be pretty easy to find. And then we just want to carefully cut into the actual sack. We want to cut it in half. But we do want to get in there. Okay, so then what you should be able to see be really careful opening these guys. It's nice when they're undescended because then you don't have to go into the trouble of actually opening these, but in this case we do. So, and there we go. So what we've got right here is this nice little ball right there, and that nice little ball, that is your testy. You can see it kind of looks like an ovary, but it's a little rounder. This flap surrounding, that is your uh, epididymis. That is surrounding this guy. It's providing protection towards him. And we've got some more stuff in here, but we don't really need to know any of that. We basically just need this guy, which is our testing right there. And that's in our scrotal sac. Together, this whole thing is the scrotum. Again, this is the penis leading up to the urogenital opening. So now it's time for cleanup. We're all done for the day. We need to package up our pig and clean our tools. So the first thing that you want to do is you probably want to set aside your tools so you can go clean them. You want to make sure that you remove any kind of pins. If you were using any pins to hold the pig up, you want to remove those and again set those aside to be cleaned. Now remember, we've got our pig tied up, but we don't want to untie our pig. What we want to do is we want to simply slide these off so that we basically got our pig on a string so that next week we can just slide them back around. Now, what's important, what you want to do is you want to get some paper towels and again, you want to get these damp but not super wet. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some water on them and then we're going to squish them out. If you use too much water on these pigs, they'll actually start uh, deteriorating and they'll start um, basically melting away. So some of your finer organs you might not be able to see for next week. So we want this damp but certainly not wet and dripping. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take some of this BioShield, which is this pink stuff which should be sitting on your TA's desk, and you want to spray anything that's been exposed. So any of these organs that are open, the cheek that's been open, the throat, you want to give a nice spray to all that. And then what you want to do is you want to take your wet paper towels or your damp paper towels and you want to start covering the inside of your pig. So we're going to stuff him a little bit here. Get those organs covered. Anything that might dry up and start to 
to break away. We don't want that. So we're going to stuff him here just like that. Make sure he's nice and covered. Anything we've opened is covered. So then what I do is I take a couple more paper towels and I kind of close him like this and I wrap the strings around. Maybe once. Again, you don't have to tie him up super well because he's going in a bag already. But you want to keep him so that his organs are going to stay nice and covered. So then I place them in some extra paper towels and wrap them up just like that. So you've got a nice little almost pig in a blanket. So what we're going to do is we're going to set him aside for just a second and we're going to go and we're going to get our bag. So remember these are the bags that we used at the beginning of the class. They came with a tag and strings. Well we've already used our strings so these should be already on your pig. Remember never throw the strings away because you won't get any more. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your tag and you're going to write your name on it, your pig's name on it, the class and the teacher's name. So what we've got here is I've named my pig Babe. My students are John and Jane. Tuesday at 11 is the class time and Stephanie is the instructor. So again, this is how your tag should look. So what you're going to do is you're going to place your little package of pig into your bag all the way on the bottom like so. What I do is I kind of squish out the air and then twist them. So you can see a nice little pig package, not a lot of air is in there. And then you want to take your name tag and just twist it around like so, so that we've got a nice little package of pig. So next thing you're going to do is in the back of the room there are going to be several drawers with several names on them. Those names are TA names and the class time. So you're going to find your drawer with your uh, teacher's name on it and then you're going to place it in the drawer just like so. So these pigs are going to sit here until next week. So then we've got our tray and in the beginning we're going to have lots of little pig bits on the tray. So what you want to do is you want to come over here to the animal parts bin. So this is bin number one and you want to take off any of those pig bits. And those are big chunks that you can pick up with your bare hands. So you want to make sure that you get all of those off your tray. So next thing you want to do is you want to come over here to the pig juice bin and you want to dump out any excess juices into the pig juice bin. And finally what you want to do for the tiny, tiny little bits of pig that we can't get off with our hands, you want to get some wet paper towels and you want to scrape the bottom of your tray. So we're going to scrape this nice and good so that all the little tiny pig bits that are in the paper towel are actually going to go into this bin that says paper towel with pig bits, okay? So those are the three bins. After that, we've got our nice tray. We're going to take it over to the sink. One squirt of soap is fine, and then some water. Basically, this is just to get any of that kind of leftover juice or the smell off. Pig bits never go in the sink. There is a grate at the bottom of this to collect any pig bits. Now remember, cleanup points are important, so you want to make sure that this grate is completely empty and there's no pig bits that have got caught up in it. And your TAs can be very particular about that. Now, once we've got our nice soaked and rinsed and clean tray, these actually get stacked down below nice and neat. So you want to make sure that these trays are always stacked in a fashion where they can breathe so the air can get through here. What you can see, this is my favorite way of stacking them down here, which is basically stacking them 90 degrees from each other. And so this lets the air get into the tray and dry out that wax so you don't have that smelly, nasty pig smell. And trust me, if there are pig bits in the sink, they're going to get stuck and they're going to start to really, really smell. So no pig bits in the sink, no juice in the sink. Make sure your trays are nicely stacked so that nice air can get through them. With our tools, basically you're going to wash them the same way. A little soap, a little water, and then you're going to dry them off. Soap. Water. These don't have to be dried super well because again they're just going to be used for your pig day section. So a couple of paper towels, nice clean tools. Once we are completely done with the cleanup because sometimes things get splattered, then you are free to take off your gloves in a safe fashion and gloves and any kind of other paper towels that you've used that don't have bits in it can just go in a regular garbage. Okay guys, so you're all done with the pigs, you've got your pigs put away, you've got all your tools put away, trays put away. The very, very last thing, if you borrowed goggles from us, they need to go in the used goggle bins. 
That is because if somebody comes back and you put this back on the new goggle tray, then they're going to have their sweat all over your sweat and it's just going to be gross. So make sure used goggles go in the used goggle bins for cleaning. Last but very, very not least is wiping down the desk. So you want to make sure that all your stuff has been off the desk and you want to take this bleach that we'll have provided for you and this little squeeze bottle and you just basically want to coat your desk like so and then there will be sponges provided with those bottles and you want to make sure that you get a nice covering of the bleach. And that's just basically to ensure that no future students have to use this desk with nasty pig stuff all over them.